What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about how to perform a cranial nerve exam. Before we get started, make sure you guys go down in the description box. We'll have links to our Patreon. On our Patreon, we'll have comprehensive notes on the physical exam that we're gonna be doing on Q today, going through all the cranial nerves in a sequential order. So go check that out. Also, if you guys like this video and benefit from it, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please, most importantly, subscribe. So let's go ahead and get into it. So Q, today I'm gonna to be performing a cranial nerve exam on you. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go over, wash my hands, make sure that we're being clean. And so when we're doing a cranial nerve exam, we're gonna start, it's first important to remember that we have a total of 12 cranial nerves. We're gonna start from cranial nerve one and work our way down to cranial nerve 12. The first cranial nerve that we're gonna evaluate is the olfactory nerve. The function of the olfactory nerve is primarily for smell or olfaction. So we need to know how do we evaluate that here on Q. So the first thing I need to do is make sure that Q's nasal passages are patent, that there's no obstruction that could alter the reliability of my test. So Q, what I'm gonna have you do is plug your right nose here for me, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna have you take a breath in through your nose and out through your nose. Good, and I'm gonna do the same thing for the other one. Good, and I hear complete patency of that nasal airway, so I know that there's not gonna be anything that's altering my actual test. Now that I know that, what I'm gonna have Q do is I'm gonna have you close your eyes and again, cover and include your right nostril. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present a particular smell to him, and I want him to be able to identify what that particular smell is. So Q, can you tell me what you smell here? It smells like coffee. Perfect, so that is perfect intactness of that olfactory nerve. We're gonna do the other side. Keep your eyes closed. And again, Q, I'm gonna present a smell to you. Can you tell me what you smell? That's cinnamon. Perfect. So the olfactory nerve is intact, beautiful. Now, here's something that we gotta be thinking about. If the olfactory nerve wasn't working properly and they weren't able to identify those smells, that could be indicative of something called anosmia. Now, anosmia can have various causes. It could be acquired, and think about it. If there was an infection of the nasal mucosa, like in a rhinosinusitis, like COVID-19, or there was damage to those nerves, like in Parkinson's disease, or compression of that nerve, like in a tumor, like a meningioma, or damage to the nerve from like a fracture of the ethmoid bone, those could be potential causes causes of anosmia, but it also could be congenital where you don't form that olfactory nerve in something called Kalman syndrome. Now, the olfactory nerve, we don't commonly test this unless Q came in today complaining of some decreased or loss of smell. That covers cranial nerve one. Let's now move on to the second cranial nerve, also known as the optic nerve. The optic nerve is primarily responsible for vision, and we can test this in many different ways. The first way we're gonna test this is by the visual acuity test using our good old Snellen chart. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so we're gonna be assessing visual acuity on Q. The best way to do that is just your good old Snellen chart. And on the bottom, I'll tell you the distance that you generally want to be away from the patient to examine that. It's about six feet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and have Q read some letters off for me. So Q, what I want you to do is cover your right eye. And Q, can you read these letters here all the way at the bottom from left to right? Yep, uh, E, C, T, P, N, L. Beautiful. So his left eye, OS 2020, good stuff. We're gonna cover the other eye, so now we're gonna be testing his right eye. Same thing, Q, at the bottom here, can you read the letters from left to right? Mm -hmm. E, C, T, P, N, L. Beautiful. So his right eye, OD 2020, now we're gonna test both eyes. Can you read the last line left to right here? E, C, T, P, N, L. Good, so both eyes, OU 2020 visual acuity is on point. Let's now move on to the next test, which is gonna be visual fields. All right, so we've tested Q's visual acuity. His was perfect, 2020, right eye, left eye, both eyes. Now, if he did have those higher numbers, it wasn't 2020, maybe 2070, 2100, and one or both eyes, then I'm thinking that there's something going on. And there could be various reasons for this. There could be some retinopathy, maybe diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy. If he was older, which he's not, I might be thinking about macular degeneration, or maybe just a general astigmatism of some kind. So that's what I would be thinking about if there was something going on with his visual acuity. Now, if we're going to assess visual fields, that's the next thing that we're gonna test on him. The best way to do that is by doing a finger counting method. There's many different ways. We're gonna use the finger counting method on him. So Q, what I'm gonna have you do is kind of turn your, kind of like uh, 
yep, perfectly straight aligned with me. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you cover your right eye. What I wanna do is I wanna test Q's peripheral field and his central visual field. So he's covering his right eye. I'm gonna close my left eye to keep my visual fields similar to his. And I'm gonna have my arms about equidistant between me and him. And I'm gonna come up so I'm in kind of like a superior quadrant of his central and peripheral fields. And Q, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some numbers up. I want you to tell me what numbers you see, okay? Okay. Two. Good. Two. Good. And I'm gonna come down to my inferior quadrants. Same thing, Q. Tell me how many fingers I'm pointing. One. Good. Two. Good. And so by doing that, I'm testing the visual fields, peripheral on the left, central on the left. I'm going to do the same thing with the other eye. So I'm going to have you cover your left eye. He's covering his left eye, so I want my visual fields to be the same as his. So I'm going to close my right eye. Same thing. I'm going to get my arms about equidistant away. I'm gonna come up into about the superior quadrants. Same thing, Q. Can you, I want you to tell me how many fingers I'm pointing up. Two. Good. Two. Good, I'm gonna come down to the inferior quadrants. One, two. Good, and so both visual fields, the peripheral and central on the right eye are beautifully intact and there's no field cuts. What would I be worried about? If I was doing this and Q lost his vision, his peripheral visual fields on both eyes. I'd be thinking about something called bitemporal hemianopia. And that's a very, very common uh, when there's a pituitary tumor sitting on that optic chiasma because it, it affects the fibers that are crossing. If there was something where, let's say he couldn't see the visual fields on his left peripheral and his right central, then I'm thinking that he's losing his field cuts, there's field cuts on the left visual fields. And that's called left homonymous hemianopia, which means that there could be a right optic tract lesion or a right occipital lobe lesion. So these are things to be thinking about when you're assessing someone's visual fields. One more thing to remember is when you're assessing visual fields, we were doing the counting finger kind of method. There is other ways to do it. You can do the wiggling finger method, which is a kinetic target. And so those are easier to identify than something like static, like just your fingers, okay, like counting. So I would highly suggest do the counting fingers method. And if there was a field cut, then do the wiggle finger method afterwards. But in this case, Q's visual fields are full on confrontation. So the next thing that we'll assess for Q is we're gonna go ahead and assess his pupillary reflexes. All right, so when we're gonna be examining Q's pupil responses, the first thing that we need to do before we even go and shine a light in those beautiful green eyes is we need to take and look at his pupils. And so I just wanna kind of notice really quickly just looking at them in an ambient light, it, are they pretty much symmetrical? So I wanna make sure that one side is not bigger than the other if they're dilated, okay? The next thing I wanna make sure that they're not pinpoint. And I wanna make sure that they're nice and round. So by looking at them, they look nice and equal, they look round. Now I need to determine if they're reactive to light. So this is where we test the pupil reflex. It's important to know the pathway of the pupil reflex. You shine a light into his eye, it hits the optic nerve. The optic nerve will send that information to your brainstem, particularly the midbrain, activating the third cranial nerve. The third cranial nerve will then send out supply to his actual, uh, his muscles of the, uh, around the pupil and cause them to constrict. So I should be able to examine a direct response and then a consensual response. Let me show you what that looks like. So if I took a light here, I'm shining it into his right eye. As we come here, I'm gonna bring the light in Look at that constriction right there. When from me shining light into this eye, that's called the direct response. I'm gonna shine the light into the right eye, but look at his left eye, it should constrict. That is called the consensual response. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other eye because I wanna notice that they're both, it's reactive similarly on both eyes. So I come over here, shine the light into his left eye, look for that direct uh, response, nice constriction, and then again, focus on his right eye and look for that nice constriction of the right eye, that's the consensual response. So that's gonna tell me my pupil reflex. Now, it's important to remember, if there was an issue where the pupils didn't respond the way you wanted them to, they didn't react, in other words, they didn't constrict, or there was an unequal restrict, uh, constriction, you gotta think about the, prop, uh, the parts in that pathway. Is there something wrong with the optic nerve? 
Is there something wrong with the midbrain or is there something wrong with my oculomotor nerve? The easy one to kind of just test really quickly while you already have your light here is what's called a relative afferent pupillary defect or an RAPD. This is testing to see if there's something wrong with his optic nerve sensing the light. So what I would do is, is I would shine a light and let's say he has a right optic nerve lesion. So he's not gonna be able to pick up the sensations as well when I shine that light into his right eye. That's gonna to lead to decreased signals going to his midbrain, decreased signals going through the oculomotor nerve, and it's not gonna be causing constriction of those pupils now. If they don't constrict, they may dilate a little bit. And that's called a relative APD, also sometimes referred to as a Marcus gun pupil. So if I were to do the swinging light test to look for a relative APD, I'm just gonna focus on one eye at a time. I would shine a light, look at the constriction in that pupil, note it very, very interestingly, then come to the other one, shine the light into that. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that constriction to be the same amplitude in both eyes. And I'm looking for them to constrict and not dilate. Okay, if I shine the light into that right eye that was damaged, what would happen then? he would dilate, both eyes would dilate because there's an issue with his optic nerve, the afferent pathway. If there was problems with the midbrain, there could be a stroke. If there's a problem with the third nerve, maybe there's a herniation that's compressing it or a communicating artery aneurysm, the posterior cerebral communicating artery that's compressing it as well. The last thing that I could test is after I've done the pupillary and the swinging light test, is I could do what's called a blink to threat test. This also tests the second cranial nerve as well as another nerve called the facial nerve. So what I would do to test the blink to threat is I would take my hands, I would have them look straight forward and I would come like I'm gonna hit him, I obviously wouldn't, but I'd get close enough that it would trigger his optic nerve to sense that, send that to his brainstem, activate the facial nerve, come out and the facial nerve will cause the orbicularis oculi to contract. So I'll do the same thing on that one and on that one, and he has a blink to threat on both sides, so it means that that is intact with respect to his optic and his facial. After we have completed the pupils, looking at it through the pupil reflex, the swinging light, and the blink to threat, now what we can do is, is we can do a fundoscopic exam. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do what's called fundoscopy. We're gonna take a look at a bunch of different stuff in Q's eye. And so we're gonna be looking at the retina, we're gonna be looking at the optic disc, we're gonna be looking at some of the blood vessels in that area, and we're also gonna be looking for something really, really quick called a red reflex. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take here my ophthalmoscope. I'm gonna kind of brace my hand over here on Q's head. And then I'm gonna take my light here and I'm just gonna kind of look through it to see if I find the red reflex. And then once I find that, I'm gonna follow it in and take a look at his retina. And what I'm noting here is I'm noting his optic disc. I'm looking to see if it's pale, if it's cupped, if it's blurred margins around it. I'm looking at the retina to see if there's any what's called drusen or micro hemorrhages or cotton wool spots. I'm looking at the blood vessels as well to see if there's any AV nicking or if there is any copper wiring um, and just seeing if there's any signs of retinopathy there. And then if I can, I'll look a little bit towards the macula and see if I see any lesions there as well. After I've done that on the right eye, I'm gonna do the same thing, except I'm just gonna come over here on this side. Again, brace my hand here, have my light kind of zooming in there, and with my left eye, find his red reflex and follow it all the way in, noting all the things that we just talked about in his right eye. After we've performed the fundoscopic exam, that would pretty much conclude our cranial nerve two. Things that I could be looking for that would be abnormal if you really get a good look at it is sometimes if the optic disc is really blurred and the margins are a little hard to see, it could be indicative of what's called papilla edema, which could be indicative of high intracranial pressure. If the vessels look a little odd, there's AV nicking, there's copper wiring, that could be indicative of maybe some retinopathy. Same thing, hypertensive or diabetic. And again, looking for any macular degeneration or any micro hemorrhages in the retina as well. After we've performed the second cranial nerve exam, we've pretty much finished everything in that, we're gonna move on to three cranial nerves in tandem. The third cranial nerve, which is known as the oculomotor, the fourth, which is known as the trochlear, 
and the sixth, which is known as the abducens nerve. These are really, really good at moving our muscles of the eye, what's called the extraocular muscles, and there are so many of them. Easiest way that I find you guys to remember them is LR6. Lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve, abducens. The superior oblique, SO4, is supplied by the trochlear nerve, and all the rest of them, superior rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, medial rectus, and even the levator palpebra superioris is supplied by the third cranial nerve. So when we're noting extraocular movements, what I like to do before I even have him follow my finger and fixate and track, as I just want him to kind of look at me. You can have you kind of look straight at my nose here. And I'm looking at his gaze. This is very, very important to note because I want to note if his gaze is midline, meaning that all the muscles are working kind of nicely, that not one's pulling or not one's weak and it's deviating anywhere. So I want to make sure that they're midline and that there's no disconjugate gaze, not one wonky eyes looking out this way or looking in a different direction than it should be. After I've noted that his gaze is midline, then I'm going to assess his ability to fixate on my finger. So Q, what I want you to do is just look at my finger. And I want you to only follow my finger with your eyes, not your head, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make an H. So I'm gonna move this way towards the right. As I move to the right, think about what muscles I'm activating. I'm activating the right lateral rectus and the left medial rectus. I'm going up. I'm testing his superior rectus and the inferior oblique. Coming down, testing the inferior rectus and the superior oblique. Going back over this way, testing his left lateral rectus, right medial rectus. Coming up, testing his superior rectus, inferior oblique. Coming down, testing his inferior rectus and superior oblique. And again, we can come back to midline. All of those movements were beautiful. There was no weakness or paresis towards one side. He didn't have a preference. They were moving nice and smooth. Other things that you'd want to ask is, while he was doing that, did you develop any double vision at all, Q, while I was moving my fingers around? No, so that's good as well. The other thing that you want to look for is if you really can sometimes see it, Sometimes if you move your, eye, your finger in one direction, it can trigger like a little beating of the eyes called a nystagmus. And sometimes that's something that you'd want to further evaluate as well. But in Q's case, extraocular movements were intact. They were full, nice pursuit, smooth movements. The next thing I would do is I would test something called saccades. And these are your nice reflexive eye movements. These kind of are coordinated by your frontal eye fields and your frontal lobe and your paramedian pontine reticular formation in your brainstem. And so what I like to do with this is I'm going to test his volitional saccades. So Q, can you go ahead and look to the right and look back at me? Look to the left, look back at me. Look up, look back at me. And then I'm going to have you go ahead and look down and then look back to me. All those movements were really, really quick. They weren't slow. There wasn't any nystagmus, and they were nice and smooth. So the saccades, the saccadic eye movement was perfect, and it's moving perfectly well. The last thing that I would do for his extraocular, well, his third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves is I would look at his eyelids, particularly the upper eyelids. There's a muscle called the levator palpebra superioris, which helps to pull the eyelids up. Sometimes if there's injury to the third cranial nerve or the sympathetic plexus, that can droop. And that can cause something called ptosis. So I just wanna take a look at his eyelids. Can you look straight at me, Q? And I don't notice any drooping of one eyelid or the other. So that's perfect, no ptosis present. So that's how we would test our third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve. The next cranial nerve that we would go and test is the trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth cranial nerve. The fifth cranial nerve is responsible for a couple different functions. One is sensations of the face. So how would I test sensations of the face? Well, there's two types of sensations that I want to test. One is light touch, and the other one is more of like a pinprick type of sensation. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna go over here and get my cotton swab, and I'm gonna get the a broken end of my cotton tip applicator. And we're gonna go ahead and test Q's ability to identify light touch of the face. So Q, what I want you to do is close your eyes. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna test this top division here. So Q, whenever you, I want you to tell me if you feel this, okay? Can you feel that Q? Yes. Good. Can you feel this? Yes. 
Good. Did they feel the same on both sides? Yes. Good. So his first division, V1, the ophthalmic division, he picks up light touch sensations equally on both sides. Now I'm going to come down to the middle. Can you feel this, Q? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel the same? Mm -hmm. Good. And then that's the V2 division or the maxillary, and I'll come down to the mandibular, V3. Can you feel this, Q? Yes. And can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel the same? Mm -hmm. Good. And so that tells me that the light touch sensation of the trigeminal nerve is intact. Now what we'll do is we'll test like a pin prick, kind of a little bit more of a, uh, an intense stimulus, like a pain stimulus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the end of a cotton tip applicator, break it off, and I have a nice little pointy end. We'll be nice and gentle to Q here. We won't be too mean. So Q, I'm going to have you close your eyes again, and we're going to do the same thing. Can you feel this, Q? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel the same? Mm-hmm. Can you feel this? Mm-hmm. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel the same? Yep. And can you feel this? Yep. Can you feel this? Yep. And does it feel the same? Yep. Another thing that we could do if we really wanted to determine if he could discriminate the differences is I could go back and forth. And I could say, can you tell me what this feels like? Is it a soft or cotton swab sensation or is it the pin prick sensation? We're going to defer that at this point, but that's the way that you could go about kind of determining the discrimination in this aspect. But in this case right here, V1, V2, V3 sensations of the trigeminal nerve are beautifully intact. The next thing that we would do is we would test the motor function, okay, which he, the, the trigeminal controls the mastication muscles, the muscles that are involved with chewing. Three primary muscles that we'll examine. The first one that we'll examine is the temporalis muscles, the second one is our masseter muscle, and then the other one's really deep called the pterygoids. So the first thing that we'll do is, is I'm just going to go ahead and take a look at Q, and I'm going to notice any asymmetry. If maybe one muscle is a little bit more hypertrophied and thicker than the other, and I don't notice anything obvious on this kind of examination. Then what I'll do is I'll have him clench his jaw, okay? When he clenches, he's going to activate two muscles, temporalis and the masseter. I just want to go ahead and palpate and see if I feel those muscles kind of like contracting. And the same thing. Oh yeah, these are, he's got a jaw of steel. So when you're feeling those, you're feeling for the tone. And the other thing you could ask is, did it feel tender when I palpated around that area there? No. Good. So that means that the trigeminal nerve, which is supplying the masseter and the temporalis, is working well. Next thing we'll do is the pterygoids. So with the pterygoids, I'm going to have you open up your mouth. Mm -hmm. And don't let me push it close. And that's nice and strong, uh, good uh, strength against the resistance. And so the pterygoids are working well too. The next thing that we could do is there's the reflexes. So we could test reflexes, and one of the really, really big ones to test, especially in a, uh, a comatose patient or an altered patient, is what's called the corneal reflex. This is one of the first reflexes or first types of things on the trigeminal nerve, if it's damaged, to go. And so the corneal reflex, it's important to know, the sensory, afferent, efferent pathway. Afferent is going to be the trigeminal nerve. It supplies the cornea goes into the brainstem and activates what nerve? In this case, it would activate the facial nerve, which would come and cause the orbicularis oculi to contract. So what I would do is I would have Q, I'd have you kind of look like straight here. And what I would do is I would just come here and tap over that cornea area and it should trigger a blink. Sorry, Q, I'm gonna do this one more time. And again, triggers that blink type of effect. So that would tell me that the corner reflex is beautifully intact. There's nothing going on with the facial afferent, nothing, I'm sorry, nothing going on with the trigeminal uh, via the afferent and nothing going on with the facial efferent pathway. The last thing I could test, if you really want to go the extra miles in Ninja Nerd, is you could test what's called the jaw jerk reflex. And this could be in something that is really important in what's called an upper motor neuron lesion. Upper motor neuron lesions usually produce what's called hyperactive reflexes. And so what I could do is I could have Q, could you open up your jaw a little bit here for me? I'm going to go ahead and place my finger over kind of the chin mental region here. And I'm just going to go ahead and tap my finger with my reflex hammer. And what I'm looking for is if someone had an upper motor neuron lesion, their jaw jerk reflex would be very pronounced, very hyperactive. And so that's something that you'd want to look for and think about if they have some type of upper motor neuron lesion that you're investigating or you're aware of. So that's how we would assess the trigeminal nerve. So we've so far, we've covered one, two, three, four, five, and six. The next one that we're going to cover is the facial nerve or cranial nerve seven. This one is primarily having a motor function, particularly for the muscles of facial expression.
So how do we test this? The first thing, it's really easy. You actually just would tell Q, you'd look at him first before you have him do anything. Just take a look at his face. Look for any asymmetry at rest. Do I see that maybe one eyelid is pulled, like his forehead is a little bit less wrinkled on one side? Do I see a flattening of his nasal labial fold on one side? Things like that. In this case, his face is symmetrical just at rest. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trigger some movements. So Q, can you go ahead and raise your eyebrows and look to see if it's symmetrical on both sides, which it is, okay? Next thing I do is I have him close his eyes really tight and don't let me open them. Beautiful, beautiful. So him closing those eyes and keeping them closed is a good sign as well. Next thing I would do is I would have him smile showing teeth. <laughs> okay, look at that smile. <laughs> So what we're noticing is that it's symmetrical. It's not kind of drooping, not pulling more on one side. And I'm looking at those nasal labial folds to see if there's any flattening of one side as well. The last thing that I would test is I would have um, Q puff out his cheeks. And I would try to push on those and see if they collapse really easily or if he couldn't actually puff his cheeks out at all. And again, all the motor functions which are controlled by the facial nerve in Q's situation are completely intact, normal strength in all of those situations. There's one more function particularly that you could examine for the facial nerve, and that is taste. In this case, we're going to defer it, but the facial nerve it has taste sensation. It picks up taste within the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And you should remember your tastes. It's sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and technically even umami. So what I would do is, if I were to explain how I would do this, I would have Q close his eyes, stick his tongue out. I would take a particular taste and place it on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and say, Q, what did that taste like? And he would say, it tasted like sweet, sour, salty, or bitter. If there was any loss of sensation there, that would make me think that there may be potentially something wrong with the facial nerve. All right, so before we move on to the next cranial nerve, it's important to remember one last thing. Remember that if there is an issue where the uh, muscles of facial expression, which are controlled by the facial nerve, are altered in such a way, it's important to perform those functions, evaluating him, uh, raising his eyebrows, closing his eyes, smiling, and puffing out his cheeks because it can help us to differentiate an upper motor neuron lesion, like a stroke, versus a lower motor or neuron lesion, something like Bell's palsy. Okay, so that covers our facial nerve. The next thing that we're gonna do is move on to the next cranial nerve, which is called the vestibulocochlear nerve, or also the cranial nerve eight. Now there's two portions that we're gonna test, the cochlear portion, which is for hearing, and the vestibular portion, which is more for your balance and coordination aspects. So when we test the cochlear portion, we're just testing hearing. And the best way to do this is testing what's called auditory acuity. So what I'll have Q do is I'll have you occlude your right ear, cover your right ear, and I'm gonna kinda just rub my fingers together and present it next to his left ear and ask him if he can hear it. Can you hear that, Q? Yes. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move far away until, and then tell me when you can't hear the sound. Can't hear it. Good, so he could hear it right next to his ear and he could hear it at a pretty decent distance away. So that means that that left ear is hearing everything properly. There's no signs of deafness or decreased auditory acuity on that side. We're gonna do the same thing. Cover the left ear. And again, can you hear this cue? Yes. Tell me when you can't. Can't hear it. Good, so again, same thing. Could hear it right next to the ear and could hear it a pretty decent distance away. So again, that right ear is also picking up everything. Auditory acuity is attacked on that side. Now let's pretend for a second that Q was saying, hey, either came and complaining, I'm having some problem hearing out of this right ear, or when I do this test, maybe he can't even hear my fingers right next to his right ear. That would lead me to do another test to evaluate what's going on with this. Is there some type of deafness, like a conductive deafness, or a sensory neural deafness? And that's when we would do something called the Weber and Rene test. So the first test we're gonna do is we're gonna do what's called the Weber test. So I'm gonna use my tuning fork. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a nice little bang to it. And I'm gonna place this on his forehead. And I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna ask you, hey Q, can you hear this equally on both sides? Or do you hear it more on one side than the other? It's equal. Equal. So there's no lateralization of the sound. And that's good because generally if someone has conductive deafness, it'll lateralize to the ear that they're having problems hearing out of. And if it's sensory neural deafness, it'll lateralize to the good ear, the, the one that they're not having any issues with. 
So since you could hear it equally on both sides, I could stop right there, but if we're gonna be a little bit more thorough, the next thing we could do is let's say that he lateralized, he heard it a little bit more louder on the right side, then I would do something called the Rene test. I'll do the same thing, give a nice little bang to my tuning fork. And what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna place this on his mastoid process. And I'm gonna ask him, Q, can you hear this? Yes. Tell me when you can't hear it. Can't hear it. So then what I would do is I would bring this next to his ear and ask him, can you hear this still, Q? Yes. Good. And so since he could hear the actual sounds when I put it on his mastoid and next to his ear canal, that's a, that means that air conduction is greater than bone conduction, which means that it's most likely normal, but there could be signs of sensory neural deafness. You would just have to do further testing, like audiometry testing. So again, big thing to do with these is auditory acuity. If there is an issue, you can follow it up with a Weber to look for lateralization, and then Rene to determine if the air conduction is greater than the bone conduction, which would be normal, but also could be indicative of sensory neural deafness, or if I did the same test where I put it behind his mastoid process, he says he could hear it. Then I move it next to his ear and he can't hear it. That means that the bone conduction is greater than the air conduction and that could be indicative of something like a conductive deafness. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna test the vestibular portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And this involves a test called the past pointing test. And so what I'm gonna have Q do is I'm gonna have him kind of extend his arms outwards, two fingers, and I'm gonna put my two fingers kind of just underneath it. And then Q, what I want you to do is raise them above your head and bring them back down to touch my fingers. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have him close his eyes and do it two times. Go ahead. And what I'm noting is if he's able to do this and come back and touch my fingers. And the fact that he is able to do that tells me that the vestibular portion of his vestibular cochlear nerve is intact. He's able to have that proprioceptive sensation and his tracks are activating properly to bring him back to where my fingers were. So that's a good sign. The vestibular portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve is beautifully intact. If there was some issues there, you'd start thinking about maybe an inner ear disorder or maybe some type of brainstem dysfunction. But in his case, it's good. So we've concluded vestibular cochlear. Now we're at the point of the glossopharyngeal nerve, which we're gonna combine, because they work in tandem with the vagus nerve. So glossopharyngeal nerve is the eighth cranial nerve, I'm sorry, ninth cranial nerve, and the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. They work in tandem except for one little exception. The glossopharyngeal nerve also is responsible for taste, right? But where? Remember the fascia was for the what? Anterior two-thirds? And then the glossopharyngeal is gonna be for the posterior one-third of the tongue. And again, I would be doing what? Same thing I said before, I'd have him close his eyes, stick his tongue out, and I would present taste stents on that posterior one-third of the tongue, have him identify that. The inability to identify that could be, so there might be something wrong with the glossopharyngeal nerve. But more specifically, we're gonna test the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve in tandem. The best way to do that is doing what's called the gag reflex. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a cotton tip applicator. You can also use like a tongue depressor if you wanted to do that. And we're gonna go ahead and tap the posterior pharynx or near the tonsillar pillars to trigger a reflex. So it's important before we do that to know the pathway. Sensory, since the sensations from the soft palate, the uvula, the tonsillar pillars, and the pharynx are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerves. When I tap it, it'll activate that. Go to the brainstem, activate the vagus nerve, which controls the muscles of the soft palate, the uvula, and the pharynx, and some of the muscles around the tonsillar pillars, triggering a contraction of those muscles. If I tap it and he gags, that means that the reflex is intact, those nerves and the brainstem is intact. So let's go ahead and test that reflex. So I have my cotton tip applicator here. What I will do is I'll have Q open up your mouth really quick. I'll be nice and gentle and I'll come back and I'll go ahead and tap. <coughs> Sorry, buddy. Yeah, good. Tap that area and we were able to trigger kind of a gag reflex. I won't do it again. I don't want to be mean, but I could try to do that near the tonsillar pillars on both sides or the pharynx. But either way, his gag reflex is intact. Now here's something to remember. If someone has a negative gag reflex, does that mean that there is a lesion? It could, but it also may not be something that you have to worry about. Gag reflexes should be something that if they had it previously and they lost their gag reflex, that would be something that you wanna be concerned with. But generally, someone could have a negative gag reflex and everything be totally fine.
The next thing that we want to do is we've tested sensation of glossopharyngeal. We've tested some of the functions of the vagus. What else do we have to do? Well, the vagus nerve is responsible for not only just the triggering the gag response, but also it helps to move that soft palate, that uvula, and it also is involved with swallowing and speech. So we gotta test all of those. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna take a look at Q's mouth and get a look at what all of those things look like at rest. All right, so now the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna, again, evaluate the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve kind of in tandem. And so before I even have Q say, ah, and look at that soft palate and uvula to see if they're deviating or if they're moving symmetrically, I just wanna take a look at his mouth in general at rest. So what I'll have to do is open up his mouth really nice and I'm just gonna take a look. Look at that uvula, see if it's deviated and look at the soft palate and see if it's also kind of one side's maybe more lifted than the other. And in Q's case, the uvula is nice and midline. That soft palate is, again, not one side is deviated more than the other. It's perfectly kind of in line and symmetrical. So that's good. And the reason why I want to look at that is because sometimes if someone has a vagus nerve lesion, what happens is that uvula can deviate. And it can actually kind of deviate uh, towards like uh, one side. And that may be telling you that there may be a vagal nerve lesion as well. So it's good to be looking at that as well at rest. Now what I'll do is, is I'll have him again open up his mouth. And I'll have him say, ah, ah, good. And I looked at that soft palate to see if it was elevating symmetrically. And again, to notice if the uvula deviated to one side or the other. Okay, so, so far we've tested the taste of glossopharyngeal. We've tested the gag reflex. We've also looked at that soft palate, that uvula, making sure it's symmetrical, no deviation that you could see in a potential vagal nerve lesion. The next thing that we wanna do is, again, the vagus nerve, we obviously know it controls the movements of the soft palate, the uvula, but it also controls the contraction of some of the muscles that are involved in swallowing or deglutition. Now, you can just ask the patient to swallow, but let's be a little bit more dramatic, and we can ask the patient to sip some water, to take a drink of water, and then go ahead and swallow. And again, we're just examining that, making sure that there's no difficulty in that process, in which Q's case, no issues. And so there is no signs of dysphagia in that case, meaning that the vagus nerve is being well propagated. There's normal action potentials down it, controlling all the deglutition process, all the muscles that are involved in swallowing. So in his case, no dysphagia. The other thing is that the vagus nerve not only controls the muscles of the pharynx and some of the muscles that are involved in swallowing, but it also involves the muscles of the larynx that are involved in speech. And so one of the particular nerves is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so what we can do is we can just ask the patient to communicate with us. Ask them a question. Q, what brings you in today? I'm here for my annual physical exam. Good, and so just by listening to that communication between me and Q, I didn't notice, notice any hoarseness in his voice. I don't notice any strider. And good communication, no aphonia or dysphonia. So the speech in this case is well intact. The other thing that I could go and do is I could test a cough reflex. The cough reflex, is basically activating the sensory fibers of the vagus nerve, going to the brainstem, coming out via the efferent fibers of the vagus nerve. In his case, he's able to communicate, he's able to swallow. I don't really need to do that. But if I did ask him to cough, and he wasn't able to cough, or he had a non-explosive cough, that may make me think about something going on with that vagus nerve. Now, this is a really important test and someone who is comatose or intubated where you would want to do a cough reflex. And you would generally take a suction and push that down the endotracheal tube to trigger some irritation there and a cough reflex. That's very, very important in comatose or intubated patients. But in this case, we're just gonna defer that and saying that his communication, his all the other functions of his vagus nerve were beautifully intact. So that covers our glossopharyngeal and our vagus kind of in tandem. Now, Let's move on to the next one, which is the accessory nerve. The accessory nerve is the 11th cranial nerve, and it's primarily going to be a motor nerve. And there's two muscles that you guys want to remember. The first one is the sternocleidomastoid muscles, and then the other one is going to be the trapezius muscles. And what we gotta do is test the strength of these muscles against resistance. And so what I'll do is I'll test the right, I'll test his sternocleidomastoid, particularly we'll, we'll test his left one. So I'm gonna have him look to the right, 
And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my hand, I'm gonna have my hand kind of palpating this muscle here, and I'm gonna ask him to res uh, resist me pushing his head in the opposite direction, this way, which he is, this muscle is contracting really nice. And I could also palpate here and ask him, did you have any tenderness when I palpated over that area? And I do the same thing. Now we're gonna test the right one. So I'd have him took to, to the left here, Again, I take my hand here, kind of brace it, have my hand kind of on the sternocleido, and have him resist that movement here, and I palpate, normal strength, he's jacked, and again, no tenderness to palpation on that area there. No. Good. And so that sternocleidal mastoids are working really, really well. Next thing I could do is I could test the trapezius muscles. And so what we do is just have him shrug his shoulders. And when I shrug, have him shrug those shoulders, my job is to try to push him down and not let him push me down. And he had good resistance, normal strength against me trying to push down on those shoulders. And so that tells me that the accessory nerve supplying these uh, trapezius and sternocleidal mastoids are working well. There's no weakness on those sides. That covers the accessory nerve. We're down to our last cranial nerve in engineers, which is the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12, is responsible for movement of the tongue. Now, before we even ask him to start sticking his tongue out at us and moving it all around, we just want to get a look at the tongue. Because the reason why is in certain lesions of the hypoglossal nerve, you want to determine if there's any atrophy or fasciculations, because that may be more indicative of like a lower motor neuron lesion. So what I'll do is I'll just have him kind of open his mouth, and I'm just going to look at that tongue. I'm going to look to see if there's any uh, atrophy, hypertrophy, or any fasciculations in this case, and I don't notice any. So that's good. The next thing we'll do is we'll test his ability to protrude his tongue out. So can I have you stick your tongue out? Good. And then I'll have you move it to the right, move it to the left. Good. And then you can go back in the mouth there. What I would be looking for is if he stuck his tongue out and it kind of like deviated to one side. That may make me think about a hypoglossal nerve lesion. So what I would be thinking about, let's say it deviated towards the left in that case, I might be thinking that maybe there's like a left hypoglossal nerve lesion, okay? So in this case, his tongue was midline. He was able to move it left and right. Full movements there, beautiful. Last thing that we would do with the hypoglossal nerve is I would have him go ahead and stick his tongue in the corner of his mouth here, like he's gonna push it against his cheek and I'm just gonna push against it. Normal strength there, same thing for the other side. Push against it, normal strength there. And that would conclude my examination of the 12th cranial nerve as well as all the cranial nerves in this physical exam video. All right, engineers, in this video today, we talk about the cranial nerves. I hope it made sense, and I hope that you guys did enjoy it. Also, down in the description box, please go check out our Patreon. There you guys will find uh, all the notes that cover this physical exam in detail, and you guys will be able to follow along with us as we go through to help in your learning process. Also, big shout out to our man Q for being our patient today in this cranial nerve exam. You guys want to check him out, connect with him. We'll have a link down in the description box to his Twitch, Q Dirty Baby. All right, engineers, we love you. We thank you, and as always, until next time.